Hi everyone. Um, it's always really daunting to follow David Brommer's introductions. It's like, <laughs> damn it, how do I go? Um, just a quick show of hands. Uh, who was here last time when I spoke about travel, photography, and the 1%? Only a few people. Awesome. It is going to be very, very similar. I've added a bit more content today, so there'll be some, some new stuff for, for the, uh, the regulars. Um, I am just going to say, quick uh, ground rule, can we please hold questions and answers off until the end? Uh, I've likened goldfish with ADHD, and if my, interrupt, if, I, sorry, if my memory flow gets interrupted, I'm probably going to be completely scattered. So if I can work fairly linear, that would be utterly fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, just a quick show of hands, who here is currently making their living from photography? You're a professional photographer. Is there is a couple? Two? Awesome. Well done. Welcome to the club. It's fun, isn't it? Uh, who here is an advanced enthusiast? So you're taking a lot of photos, you know all the basics, you're just really taking yourself to that next level. Yep, a lot more of you. Fantastic. Who here is intermediate? You've gotten the basics down pat, you're now just coveting everybody else's lens. Ooh, I want that one. <laughs> Yep, so a few of these. Who here uh, isn't a photographer, you just come here for the candy? <laughs> Definitely a few. Uh, who here is really new to photography? You've just bought a camera, you're starting to learn the basics, you're getting it all up. One, two, three. Can, if, if that's you, can you just stand up for a moment? Please? <laughs> just trust me, it's right. I know who you are, you've already held your hands up, you can stand up. Awesome. Welcome to the club. You can stay standing for a moment. Um, you need to start this with, hi, my name is such and such, and I'm an addict. Um, <laughs> photography, you can have a seat. Guys, uh, for those of you that did stand up, you are welcome. Come and see me afterwards. I'm going to give you a uh, free workshop with Remember Forever. We have a really great one on, it's called Love Your Camera, and it's how to basically make that camera an extension of your arm. So come and see me after the seminar, and I'll get you guys sorted out with that. You're very, very welcome. Um, no, photography is an addiction, isn't it? It's, it's actually the most expensive addiction in the world. We outlast drug users on lifespan, so we'll spend more over time. Uh, all Remember Forever workshops are actually built into 12 steps. All of our workshops... I don't know if it was intentional, I can't quite remember, but all of our workshops are 12-step programs because every addiction does require a 12-step program. Our workshops aren't just about learning their support groups. Um, and that's kind of how I'd like today to be a little bit as well. So one big happy support group. Um, so we've figured out where everyone's at. Okay, so travel photography, um, in my opinion, is one of the easiest styles to get into a photography, but it's also one of the hardest styles to master. It's really easy because there's no shortage of subjects. Everywhere you look, there is something you can photograph. It's easy because your subjects don't talk back to you. They don't argue. They don't ask how their hair looks. And unless it's wildlife, it's not squirming or moving out of the shot. Children, models, fashion can get pretty intense sometimes. But landscape's really about serenity. Landscape and travel photography is really about you and your subject. It's, it's, it's almost meditative sometimes. And that's really what I want to try and impart today. Um, it's hard because only a fraction of the photographs you take will generally be exceptional. Or there'll be only a fraction of the photographs you take will be unique. A lot of people, there's an expression, I think it's, um, there's nothing in the world left to be photographed. And I'll talk a bit about that later on, but you know, I'm sure there's a photo of the Eiffel Tower out there somewhere, I was <laughs> trying to think. Um, some feedback from last time I spoke was that, and it was mainly from David Brommer, that I didn't show enough photos. So what I did today before coming in or yesterday while I was prepping was quickly throw just a folder of, of some of my photos uh, from recent trips over the last 12, 18 months onto this and just hit auto animate. I don't actually know which photos they are, so we'll just talk about them really quickly as they come up. Uh, so the first one, ooh, that's nice. Okay, so that's actually a four minute exposure. Um, there was absolutely no light. That was taken in the dead of dark. The only light source I had to lock on and get a focal point was a little LED torch shining on that rock right in the center. That's running water. That's actually the river or the creek that runs through Sleepy Hollow Cemetery. And that's all that light is coming from the moon over a four minute exposure. Um, I'd never really tried four minute exposures in the dark before, so that was a bit of an experiment. Uh, next photo. Um, I don't know what city that is. Uh, New York City, so Brooklyn Bridge and uh, Lower Manhattan, taken on one of our Thursday night photography at night classes, which is probably my favorite class that we run in New York. It's, it's, it's very hard to come out of that class without decent photos. 
Uh, another one from the same class, taken from Brooklyn Bridge Park before the Brooklyn Bridge looking down over the financial district. Uh, Ooh, Aguazu Falls. If you've, <laughs> sorry, you're going? Awesome. Aguazu Falls, it's on the border between uh, Brazil and Argentina. And you can go and see it from both sides. The Arge some people think the Argentinian side is better. Uh, that's the side, the cliff face over on the right is the Argentinian side. This was taken from the Brazilian side. Um, it is definitely, well, it is a wonder of the world, and it is definitely worth seeing if you get a chance to go to Iguazu. Uh, what else have we got? Colca Canyon in Peru. Now, what's really great about this photo is it's, it was taken camera raw. I didn't adjust the camera raw at all. That's camera to computer. Um, those colors, they're natural. That's how it looks. It is one of the most beautiful valleys in the world. It's deeper than the Grand Canyon. It's bigger than the Grand Canyon. It's greener than the Grand Canyon. Uh, there's a lot going for it. It is absolutely beautiful. And then we have another one overlooking that canyon, but obviously with one of the locals sitting there, you know, knitting and making those uh, souvenir sweaters that all the tourists buy. I actually bought three. I've, I've, <laughs> It's New York winter coming up, so I'll probably wear all of them at once. <laughs> we got? Ah, okay, the Railway, Railroad Cemetery. Um, it's in Bolivia. As you come out of the salt flats of Uni, and you uh, basically are hitting the town of Uni in Bolivia, um, there is this graveyard no one seems to really know about. Um, I took, I have about 200 photos of 200 different rusted old trains. This is just one of my favorites. One of my favorites from that, uh, it's just the contrast, the sky, everything was sort of doing what you wanted it to do. Um, if I was dramatically photoshopping, I might have gotten rid of this bottle of water, but you know, um, I like to keep things fairly close when I'm doing it. Uh, what else have we got? Las Vegas. Ha. Who likes Vegas? I love Vegas. I'm a big Vegas fan. We opened in Las Vegas in August, so remember forever now do uh, night photography safaris of Lo in Las Vegas, uh, six nights a week. So if you're out going to Vegas, let us know because we'll teach you how to do that. You do come home with these photos. Um, Montauk in the Hamptons. Just one of those accidental ones. Uh, broke a lot of rules. David Brum is probably sitting there just trying to work out where the grid lines all intersect. But I really like the colors. Um, I took some that were a little bit more rule conscious. But that one just kept coming back to me as one I really liked. Fireworks. That's my hometown of Brisbane. We put on a good party. That was one exposure. So that's not a blended exposure. That was a two minute exposure. Uh, it hasn't seen Photoshop. All I did with that one, whenever I'm taking uh, fireworks photos, is I'll, I'll generally put it on bulb. And I'll let the camera just keep taking. And I'll cover the lens in between bursts. And so what I'm actually getting there is all of those different bursts in the one exposure. Uh, if you go back uh, to the BNH Insights blog over July, I actually wrote one for July 4th, um, talking about how to do this. So if you want to go back and read a bit about fireworks photography, that is there. Uh, I took this one on, on Friday night. Jefferson Memorial in Washington, DC, taken from the Tidal Basin at sunset. Um, absolutely fell in love with it. I just hadn't taken that view before. I'd seen some people do it. I wanted to do it a little bit differently. Um, I have about 10 in the series. Um, a lot of which with empty cherry blossom trees sort of interrupting the shot. But that's probably my favorite from the series and the most striking. Um, and that's what I put on the computer. So there are more photos as we go, but I just wanted to quickly give you some to, to look at and whet the appetite a little bit. Um, several years ago, I was in Africa. And I joined up with a tour group through Botswana. It's funny you mentioned Botswana. Okavenga Delta is one of my favorite places in the world to take photographs. Um, you're, you're on foot for the most part. You're not in a Jeep. You are walking amongst the animals. <laughs> Travel insurance. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about the size of my, my travel kit uh, a little bit later on, but needless to say, I'm really identifiable as a travel photographer when I'm on the road. I'm, I'm laden down. And the tour that we joined, my wife and I had joined, officially started the night before. So everyone that was already on the tour group had met, they'd had their welcome drinks, they'd bonded over you know, drinking games at the campfire. We were still in Victoria Falls in a six star resort, so I was quite happy. Um, but the next morning we made our own way to Botswana. We you know, had to cross into like four different towns. We had to take off our shoes and walk through puddles 
for some reason, this is Africa. Um, and by the time we got there, I was just so relieved to find the truck. We just unloaded, sat down, jumped up and got in the truck. Um, it was Kobe National Park where we first joined the tour. And I remember meeting everyone at the Jeeps. And as I sort of climbed up, I noticed I had the only DSLR in the group and this huge backpack full of camera gear. Everyone else was sitting there with a compact and a point and click. And you could sort of see them all getting ready, you know, pumped to go out and get some photos of animals. And they look at my DSLR with a 100 to 400 uh, sitting at the front. And uh, I got those two sentences that I completely loathe when I travel. First one. You're a photographer. <laughs> yes. Yes, I am. And secondly, you're going to get hundreds of great photos here. I wish. <laughs> I nod. I usually nod. I smile. I sort of just, you know, make friends. I'm, yeah, I hope so. And go about taking my photos. But I was fairly relieved to have actually made it. Uh, there's a seat just here, buddy. Um, I'm actually very relieved that I made it um, through Africa and made it to the, uh, to the group. So I was a little bit more um, friendly than, well, friendly. I'm not usually unfriendly, but I was a little bit more forthcoming than I might usually be. And I missed out on the bonding campfire and, and drinks. So I decided to just, look, I'm you know, hoping to get five or six, but if I get one, I'm, I'm going to be pretty happy. And he looked at me and goes, wow, you mustn't be a very good photographer. <laughs> I have this little compact camera. I get hundreds of great photos. And then he started to show me his hundreds of great photos. <laughs> this is why I usually just nod and smile. Look, to be fair, his photos weren't terrible. It, it's actually really, really hard to take a bad photo in Africa. It's, it's opportunity is everything. But it's also really hard to take a really good photo as well. Um, I spent 20 minutes waiting for that shot. When I walked into, or where we drove into, uh, I guess the clearing where the giraffes were, they weren't together. One was over there, one was over here, one was over there. And I said to the ranger guide with the shotgun that was there to protect me, can I just get out of the truck and walk over here? And she said, you are the slowest thing in the jungle. There is nothing here you can outrun. If you step out of this Jeep, you are dead. <laughs> so we sat there and waited. And as if they knew, they came and they lined up for me, shortest to tallest. Um, and it was just, it was one of those just really happy shots that you get really lucky with. And um, like I said, it's hard to take bad photos in Africa. The animals are always so willing to, you know, pose. There we go. Pose and smile and, and you know, do something cute. Um, and my favorite, I stalked this guy for about eight hours. I have maybe 120 photos of him. Um, you know, very, very curious. He kept coming up to our Jeep and looking up and got rid of those because I like being low. I ended up laying across the floor of the Jeep, sort of shooting out the door because I really wanted to try and get as close to eye level as possible. So let's talk about what takes what makes, sorry, what constitutes a really good travel photograph. Elements of a memorable, memorable travel photograph. We're going to go through the basics. Uh, some of these are quite basic, but, and they're kind of common sense, but it needs to be correctly exposed. Okay, If your photograph is blown out and bright white, it's not going to work. If it also, if it's really dark and, and ultra shadow, it's probably not going to work either. Um, I like to manually set my white balance. I use uh, the color temperature setting on my camera rather than picking sun, shade, tungsten. Not a big fan of those. Um, they're generally wrong. And composed properly. And by composed properly, I do mean that we're following things like the rule of thirds and accepted standards of composition. Uh, it's free from distraction. There is nothing that destroys a really good travel photograph like something that doesn't belong there. Um, I'm not saying that it needs to be staged. I'm saying that it just needs to be taken from an angle that is, is still natural. I remember a few years ago, I was photographing a sunrise um, on the beach. And I'd, I'd been there for about half an hour waiting for the light to do what I wanted it to do. And I set up my camera, tripod. I had the uh, cable trigger in. So I was getting all ready to go. Had a, a thermos of coffee sitting there. And I knew that in about two minutes, that light was just going to crest just that little bit more and give me that really fantastic shot. So I reached down for my thermos of coffee and quickly poured one and picked up my remote trigger, turned around, and there was this surfer. Just He'd wandered into my shot, had wet suit sort of half off, so it was just dangling around his waist. And he had his surfboard just standing there right in the middle of my shot. At that stage, I was like, well, 
okay, I can get upset about it, I can move, I'm going to miss the shot. It wasn't like I could come back the next day. This was my last day in this, in this town, so I really needed to get the shot that day. In the end, I just re-evaluated my photog uh, photographic goal, um, and I'll talk about those a bit later on, and decided, okay, he's going to be in the shot. And by an act of kismet, he was actually standing along my left vertical third. So he was actually standing where he would have needed to be for a good composition anyway. Um, so I took the shot. Really good shot, actually. I liked it straight away after I had it. Um, and about 20 seconds later, he walked down the beach. I quickly went back to plan A, took a few more photos of, of the sunrise over the beach. But honestly, that surfer one um, was the best of the group. That's not to say that anything that wanders in aimlessly is going to work. A bicycle wouldn't have worked. A dinosaur wouldn't have worked. Though it would have been very cool to photograph a dinosaur on the beach. Um, <laughs> but a surfer sort of fit in with the story that I was going for, so that kind of works as well. Uh, your photograph needs to have meaning to you as the photographer and also to the viewer. And it also needs to be different. I can't sell a photograph that everyone can download on Flickr or Google Images or Shutterstock or iStock or any of the numbers of magazines, publications and, and websites where you can download stock photography. Now, for me to actually sell a photograph, it needs to be something a little bit different, something a little bit special. As a photographer, I know that I am not the first person to photograph Machu Picchu, um, I'm the, but I've got to be the first person to photograph it the way I'm going to, if that makes sense. Um, I actually did a bit of research before I went to Machu Picchu, and I'm going to talk about that as we go. Um, our photographic process, I guess, um, is what I'm going to really talk about today, though, the Remember Forever photographic process for travel photography, how we go about setting up our trip, planning our trip, and actually taking our photos as we go. We're going to do it through the eyes of me photographing Machu Picchu. So has anyone here been to Machu Picchu? Bunch of hands. Who wants to go to Machu Picchu? Does anyone here not know what Machu Picchu is? <laughs> awesome. It's an Incan ruin in uh, Peru, about uh, eight hours, six hours out of Cuzco in Peru. It's um, a wonder of the world, and it was lost for 100 years. It was only recently refound again, so it was actually quite exciting. Um, my processes are split into two categories, before I travel and while I'm on location. Uh, research. Research is the number one thing I need to do when I'm traveling. When I start a trip, I actually start a journal. It's usually about yay big. Didn't bring one today, sorry. It's about yay big and it can fit very easily into my camera bag and it has everything. It's a handwritten account of everything I need to know before I go. Um, and I'll sort of talk about what that is in a second, but it's also um, a journal of my trip as well. So every time I take a photograph, six words might just get scrolled down, just reminding me of what I was thinking when I took that shot. Um, it includes things like the contact details. It, it, we'll talk about what it includes. Um, it talks about my photographic goal. Now, photographic goal is really important. When I say, um, sorry, just, up. When I say photographic goal, I'm talking about um, I'm talking about what I want to get out of it. I'm not saying that every photograph I take is planned, but every photograph I plan I take. If you can get the distinction, you know, it's very easy to go. Ah, oh, I'll just see how I go when I get there. But then you could be wandering around trying to figure out what you want to take photos of. But if you think about what you want before you go, at least a theme or at least the basics, you've got somewhere to start. Um, photographic goal, I'll talk about everything here I'm actually going to talk about in a bit more detail. Uh, preparation, preparation is very, very important. Um, and on location, I, we evaluate, we test, we re-evaluate, we set up, then we get our exposure right and start taking our photographs. Um, I'll talk about every step that we've put up here um, in detail as we go. Um, so first step, as I said, is research. We're all about the research. Um, as I said, we're going to do this from Machu Picchu, so I've referred to a lot of my notes on how we plan this trip out. Um, so the first thing I generally put in, uh, I get a journal, and I start writing everything down. Everything can include maps. So these are sometimes ones that I've printed out online to give me a clue of where I'm going to go. Sometimes they're little hand-drawn mud maps. Just um, okay, if I turn right at this street and go left here, and I've just drawn little diagrams um, where I think I'm going to get the angle or the composition or the photograph that I want to take. 
uh, contact details. Contact details are really important. Not mine. You know, if I lose the book, I lose the book. No, contact details of everyone I talked to prior to the trip. So I call tourism bureaus. I call travel agents. I call locals. I, if my wife would let me, I'd probably dial a random number with the right, uh, right area code and <laughs> hope I get someone on. Hey, do you live in Cusco? Let me ask you a question. But um, I do talk to a lot of people on the ground there and get a bit of an idea. What aren't people looking at? Where aren't the tourists going? What can I do that's a bit different? Is there anything as a local that you think would be really fantastic? And I get a lot of ideas as well. This is also especially important if you're getting permission. If someone gives you permission to do something while you're on a trip, write it down. If possible, get that permission emailed to you. Write down their contact details. Write down their job title. Why have they got the authority to give you permission? Permission's actually really, really important. Um, as a travel photographer, I don't like just going where everyone else is. If there is a fence that I shouldn't cross, I'm probably going to do it. If there's uh, something that says do not climb, it's like do not push the red button, I'm probably going to do it. But I do try and get permission first. Uh, this weekend just gone, I was in Washington DC. I showed you the photo of the Jefferson Memorial. Uh, has anyone here taken photos around the Capitol building? Yep, hands up if you have. Awesome, what's the big rule for taking photos at the Capitol? <laughs> Bring bail money. <laughs> Pretty much. What aren't you allowed to use? Sorry? A flash? You can use it outside. I'm talking about more outside. Tripods. Tripods are verboten. Um, I'm pretty sure the Capitol Police are wandering around with their semi-automatics and their big machine guns just waiting for, you know, a, a photographer to sort of sit there wielding a tripod. It's, <laughs> it's kind of... Um, I understand their paranoia. I understand why they've got that rule. I don't agree with that rule. I think, you know, tripods are a necessary part of photography quite often. Um, but I had my tripod uh, at the Capitol building and it was sort of tucked on top of my camera bag. It wasn't looking like it was coming out. And there was something else. There was this, as I walked in, or I was outside, as I walked up to where I saw the shot that I wanted, there was this concrete block and it was up about this high. And uh, on top of the concrete block were solar panels. And there's a big sign that says, do not climb. And, I was looking at it and you could sort of see the indecision in my head. Am I going to do it? And I'm looking up and there are these Capitol Police officers wielding machine guns and I'm like, I don't know. And one of them actually came up and wanted and he's like, hey, what's going on? You know, he wasn't asking me to leave. He wasn't, you know, telling me to keep moving along. He was just generally curious what I'm doing. I said, look, this is what I do. This is how I want to do it. If I stand up on this concrete block for 10 seconds with a tripod, are you going to shoot me? <laughs> he looked around and, you know, his supervisor wasn't there. So he said, oh, go on, just do it. And I'm really glad he did because the photograph I got was, was pretty phenomenal. Um, it had just been raining, so the solar panels were wet, which gave me this beautiful reflection of the Capitol building uh, coming down, as you can sort of see. And you can actually see some of the water droplets. Um, I'm a big fan of going out in the rain. I'm a big fan of shooting in puddles. I'm a big fan of reflections. I think reflections are one of the coolest things that we can do with photography. So I was pretty happy with it. Um, and that, but I got permission. I made sure I wrote his name down in my journal with me. So if ever um, someone looks at that photo and tries to use it against me as evidence, I'm like, no, wait, Officer Joe Scalini said I could. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, so going back to where we were up to, uh, after permissions, weather. Now, if I'm planning a trip a year in advance, generally weather.com is not that good. In <laughs> fact, if I was planning a trip a day in advance, I don't think weather.com is that good either. But I can look at historical data. If it rained three times out of 30, three days out of 30 last year in August, and the year before that, and the year before that, what are the chances that it's going to rain for 20 days the next August? Apart from global warming. It's, but it gives me a good indication of what I need to do to prepare and what I could be expecting when I'm on the ground. Uh, sunrise, sunset times. <sighs> Golden hour. I am, um, yeah, I'm up at sunrise every morning. I'm before sunrise most mornings. Um, the only time I'm not is Maybe once a week I do need to sort of sleep and catch up on sleep. Um, also thoughts on time and positions. You know, like if I know which direction the sun is, that's telling me whereabouts I need to be standing in certain things to get the certain things I want. So I'm really planning out as many of the photographs as I can beforehand. Not necessarily I want to take this and this is the exact thing in my mind I want to take, but I'm giving myself all the information I need to set myself up for success on the ground, if that makes sense. Yeah? Uh, my itinerary. I plan things out pretty well in advance. Um, my exact itinerary on the ground, say 
work out using South America as an example, I spent five and a half months on the ground. I didn't plan where I was every day. But when I knew I was going to be in a city, I planned out that. I knew where I would need to be to get the photos. But if I wanted to spend an extra day in Aguas Calientes and one less day in Cuzco, that wasn't going to be a problem. But while I was in Aguas Calientes, I knew what I wanted. Uh, photographic goals we've talked about, they're generally starting to factor into my research a little bit. Um, so let's talk a little bit about those photographic goals because it's probably a little bit controversial with a lot of photographers. A lot of photographers are like, no, 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 it's not about planning shots, it's about seeing art, it's about seeing magic. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, I, I do agree, but as, you know, a 37 year old, it's not as much fun being a struggling artist as it was when I was 22. So I really do need to think um, a lot about where my work's going to go. Who's my market audience? Am I selling these photos to a magazine? Am I selling it through a gallery? Am I, you know, just putting it up on my wall and going, hee hee, I went to Machu Picchu. So it's really about um, factoring that in. Um, your photographic goals, my photographic goals, do include sketches of image plants. So if I know there is something I want because I've seen something that I like, but it's not quite as good as I think it could be, I might sort of sketch what I, what I think is going to happen. And I will show you an example of that very soon. Um, it's, are my goals achievable? And by that I mean, if, I want to, if I'm coming to New York on vacation in summer, and one of my photographic goals is snowfall in Central Park, am I going to be able to get that photograph? Probably not, unless I get one of those artificial machines. Um, I ensure my planned images are different to everything else I've seen. Um, I always look at what other professional photographers do before a trip. So with Machu Picchu, I looked at National Geographic. I had a look at their key images of Machu Picchu. So I could sort of see what, what publications were sort of accepting as, as the pro image. And I wanted to do something pretty dramatically different, I guess, in that respect. I try and account for the time of year, time of day, and the weather. As I said, Central Park in July, no snow. Um, and I do factor in commercial value. And again, like I said, that is very, very controversial. I do agree, you chase your passion, not your pension. But at the same time, you know, I do need to sell my work. Um, just talking about preparation a little bit, actually. Um, other things I do that aren't necessarily part of my research. Now, research really covers a lot of my preparation, but obviously I do certain things like prepare my kit. I upgrade anything I want to take with me or I organize my camera gear. My camera bag is very, very anal. It's very organized. It's very OCD. My life is a mess, but my camera bag is pristine. <laughs> Not going to lie. Um, I prepay about a third of my accommodation when I travel somewhere. So I leave generally about two thirds of my trip open, but I prepay a third, especially the first few nights. Um, I like to have a base camp. I like to know where I'm going to be for at least three nights while I get my bearings and organize everything out. Let's talk about my camera kit. Um, when you, if, you, if you know your gear, you'll start imagining how much this is going to weigh. <laughs> Just keep that in your mind because I will tell you a story very soon. Uh, so camera kit involves for me uh, 5D Mark IIs, generally two of them. Uh, lenses, and for my lenses, I carry a 16 to 35 millimeter f 2.8 L. The L series 16 to 35 is my go to landscape lens. I think I shot 99 of 100 photos in South America with that lens. I think I changed it twice on the trip. It is such a good, 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 good travel lens. Uh, if you're a Canon shooter, it's amazing. Um, 24 to 105. You know, a lot of people like think the 24 to 105 is the equivalent of the old 18 to 55 kit lens, and they sell it as soon as they buy their Canon kit. I really like it. Um, I don't feel the need to go down to the 24 to 70 and get that. I don't do a lot of the portraiture stuff these days. I'm, I mainly travel, um, and the 24 to 105 just gives me that extra little bit of range, and it is still a very, very good lens at f/4. Uh, 180 mil macro. Um, I love this lens. It's um, really great. I don't use it as much on a trip as I would like to considering how much it weighs, but when you're in places where you've got beautiful gardens and trees and flowers that you might not get in your part of the world, you'll generally pull it out at least once. And for me, I only need to need a lens once for me to consider packing it in my kit. It's probably not most, the most sensible option. Uh, 50 millimeter 1.8, I don't need the 1.4, I don't need the 1.2 for $129. This is the only lens in the world that goes against the rule, you get what you pay for. 
okay? Every other lens in the world, it is a case of you get what you pay for, with the exception of this lens. $129, it's almost bouncy. It's actually one of the best portrait lenses on the market. Uh, moving through, uh, 100 to 400. That's generally if I know I'm gonna be somewhere like Africa. If I'm not going to Africa, I'm not going to worry about the 100 to 400 so much because I tend to get a lot closer to animals. Uh, just showing you. I have this photo on my phone of me wrestling with a baby Bengal tiger. Um, I tend to try and get a lot closer to animals than um, I realistically should. So um, the 100 to 400, yeah, it can be optional, but I really do like carrying it in Africa. Uh, cable release, obviously. Uh, three batteries. I like to take m multiple batteries and a zillion memory cards. That might be an exaggeration, but I do take multiple, multiple, multiple ca memory cards. Um, I also take backup storage facility. Now, I take a laptop with me when I travel, and I take two portable hard drives. So I'm actually making two backups. I keep two copies of my photos. I keep one in my suitcase, and I keep another one in my wife's suitcase. If one of us loses our luggage, I'm not losing my work. Don't go overseas and take you know, 100 fantastic images and then misplace your bag and have nothing to show for it. Back up every day. Uh, tripod. <laughs> uh, filters. I have three filters that are my go-to um, on top of the UV, I guess. The Hoya Variable ND. Um, I have that in an 82 millimeter for my 16 to 35 lens. That can make daylight look like midnight. It is an amazing lens, especially if you want to slow down your shutter speed, and we will be talking about that as we go. Um, I have the Coke and Graduated ND filter kit. If you don't know what they are, I think it's about eighty or hundred dollars for the um, for the kit. It's three plastic squares. There's a bracket system for the front of your camera, and it slides in in front. So when your sky is overexposing, when your ground is equally exposing or nicely exposing, it darkens the sky and lets that sort of expose equally. So you're still getting that dramatic sky coming through with a nicely exposed ground. It's prop for hundred dollars. Every travel photographer should have it. See, I told you I was going to tell you what to buy. Uh, and a polarizing filter. I carry a circular polarizing for every lens, um, or at least one that will fit every lens. Uh, speed light, I do carry a flash. If I'm photographing people, locals, when I'm out traveling, I will generally fill in the flash during the day. Uh, flashlight with extra batteries. Um, LED lighting panel, just in case I want to, especially. And if we think back to that first photo I showed you of um, Sleepy Hollow with the river, you do need to be able to create a little bit of light sometimes at night to get those, those beautifully slow shots. And uh, lens pens, make sure I can always clean everything as I go. And duct tape. If you don't tra carry duct tape on your travel, you're not a photographer. Just saying. Uh, if you don't want to carry a big roll of duct tape when you travel, I actually just tear strips off and wrap it around a tripod leg. So I can always just unwrap it from my tripod leg and use it as needed. That's a bit of a space-saving space tip for you there, courtesy of my wife. Uh, and I also carry a point and click. Sometimes it's, it's not achievable for me to take in um, a DSLR, but I still don't want to miss the memory. Um, so as part of preparation, like I said, I look at what other photographers are doing. Um, this was the most common photo of Machu Picchu I found. This is from National Geographic. That was their cover issue for their Machu Picchu series. Uh, Mysteries continue to lure explorers. There's a reference there if you wanted to go and check it out. I'm not making up, that was the photo they used. And I looked at it, I was like, everyone else is taking the same photo. I was expecting Geographic to be a little bit different. Um, but for me, it was good because it meant that, you know, I'm going to corner the market on difference. <laughs> um, and I really do try and be different. I think it's really important that we try to be as much as possible. Um, I was talking about camera kit and how heavy it can be. I told you to start thinking about how heavy it actually can possibly get to. Um, my camera bag weighs more than my actual suitcase when I travel. Um, I very much overpack on that. I always go over excess baggage. Um, I don't check it in though. It's If you're sitting there thinking it's 12 pounds or whatever it is for your carry-on, um, mine is usually 45, but here's a tip. Join your frequent flyer program. Okay, Talk to the airline, get it registered on your frequent flyer profile that you are carrying camera gear. You can generally get an exemption um, for having your stuff put underneath because they don't want to insure it. They don't want to be responsible for camera gear if it's in the hold. So they'll generally give you an exemption to bring it in the cabin. 
tip number one, see. Thank you. <laughs> and then you can yeah, pack in a few other things as well. Um, about 18 months ago, I was photographing Patagonia in southern Chile as part of my six-month South America extravaganza. Anyone done the W trek? Nice, nice. It's seven days of up and down and mountains and rocks. And you try not to carry too much. Uh, everyone else in the group was sort of carrying. They, we had like um, porters that were carrying you know, the bags and the sleeping bags each day. And all we were meant to carry was you know, a jacket, a sandwich, and a bottle of water. And then there was me with 45 pounds strapped to my back. Um, it was seven days of up and down and misery. And everyone in the group was being sensible. My photographic goals weren't just going to rely on one camera, one lens. It was going to be the tripod. It was going to be the filters. It's probably going to be a, a zoom lens because I knew I wasn't going to do the extreme hike up to the top of, of I can't remember what the mountain range is. Um, but I wasn't going to go there, so I was going to use the 100 to 400 to capture that. Um, I did pretty well for the first six and a half days. <laughs> um, I was only maybe between 15 minutes and 45 minutes behind the rest of the group <laughs> at any one time by the end of the day anyway, and there was always, my wife was there, so there was always a beer waiting for me when I actually did struggle into the thing. Um, on the last day, I did collapse from exhaustion. It does happen, and they brought in a horse to carry me out, and I still got great photos from horseback. Um, <laughs> smiled at everyone as I rode past. It was good. Unless you're as insane as I am, please try and, and minimize the kit that you do want to travel. Like, think about what you are going to need when you travel. But if you do know you need everything, then you know, try and pack it as concisely as possible. Let's talk about on location. The first thing I do when I get to a subject is Machu Picchu. So this is one of the typical tourist shots of Machu Picchu, uh, very similar to the National Geographic one. It's just mine, so I don't need to credit this one. Um, and the first thing I generally do is walk around. I did Machu Picchu over two days. Um, because most of the photographs I was seeing of Machu Picchu were all the same, I didn't have a lot of reference to go from, like what I wanted to get and how I wanted to get it. So day one, I barely pulled my camera out. I pulled it out to get a few test shots, just figure out the lighting. I was writing my journal, what time it was, where the sun was. I was, you know, being a little bit obsessive. I think if um, Peru were really concerned about Machu Picchu as a military target, I would have been arrested. It was really a lot of research. Um, so I walked around. I walked around for hours. Um, I tried to see what everyone else was taking photos of as well. So, um, yeah, I, I just where the clumps of tourists are were where I avoided. Um, I try to avoid clumps of tourists when I travel. Um, doo -doo -doo, let's have a look. Sorry, um, paying attention to everything, you know, where the cloud cover was, which way the wind was blowing, try and keep it all coming through. Watch what the sun is doing and how it's affecting the photograph. So where is the sun shining down? You can see that it's a lot brighter over on the left side of the photo than the right. So you can sort of see what was happening. And I was also considering how best to use my foreground. Um, for me, that's kind of, kind of an important one. Um, in that photograph, which part's the landscape? Anyone? Hand up if someone's got it. Which part of that photograph is the landscape? Yep. Which part? The, which part of that photograph is the landscape? Does anyone know? Upstairs? Thank you for playing. No. <laughs> All of it. OK, you need to think of your landscape photo as being everything from the end of your lens to infinity. All of that needs to be considered your landscape. OK? It, you need to consider how your fo foreground is going to be a part of that. Um, when you actually you know, have it all set up and you think about what you've got and you're allowed to start doing your test shot, there's another typical tourist shot of Machu Picchu. Um, you can tell my wife took it. I'm blurry. <laughs> She's not here. I'm allowed to make that joke. Um, let's just get rid of all of that. Um, so I take my test shot. I then try and reevaluate my goals. Now, notice I've moved around a little bit. It's a little bit different from what everyone else is taking. I've come right around to the left, almost like I'm dangling, and I've taken it from a completely different angle. Let's talk about what's wrong with that shot. Um, with your test shot, I actually don't mind it being on automatic. OK, God forbid. You can put your camera on automatic for your test shot or 
any other setting you want. Generally, I try and shoot manually as much as possible. I am a control freak um, when I'm shooting. Everything I shoot, and I'll talk about that exposure in a minute, but this is the one shot I don't mind being on automatic. See how your camera's interpreting it. And then we can start figuring out all of that. Just remember two things about your camera. It is, your camera is generally two things. It is lazy and it is stupid, okay? <laughs> it's true. Uh, it's lazy and it's stupid. It's generally going to use ISO as its first sort of first option for changing a setting when it's thinking for itself, uh, which is going to generally make your photo grainy nine times out of 10. It's not going to give you the shutter speed you want. It's not going to give you the aperture you want. It's going to do what's easiest for the camera. So we want to avoid that as much as possible. So I looked at my test shot. I reevaluated my goals based on that test shot. And that brings us to now the setup. So now I've started planning what's coming next. Um, I've looked at our test shot and let's bring it up again. I can see people walking, okay? There are tons of tourists. Who's ever gone on vacation and thought this would be beautiful if it wasn't for all the tourists? It's seriously my pet peeve when I'm traveling. So I figured out I'm going to need to use my tripod and I'm going to need to use that variable ND filter that makes it midnight in the middle of the day. Remember, anything um, faster than your shutter speed when you're photographing something is going to vanish from the photo. I can get rid of the tourists. Yes, I can. Um, look at them all. Look, we've got hundreds of tourists walking through my photograph like bugs I want to squash. Um, graduated ND filter is also going to help me sort of, you know, fine tune that mist a little bit. Um, let's step backwards and perhaps get a little bit more of the plateau in. And that will give us something a little bit different. Forward. Okay, let's talk about exposure really quick. ISO. So we've talked a little bit about how ISO creates grain in your photo. Too high an ISO, grainier the image. Um, it lets me have the slowest shutter speed possible and the highest quality. So I mean, that's pretty much why I really like that ISO of 100. Um, what about aperture? What's the rule for aperture? I like f8. We're going to go f8. Who's heard the expression f8 and be there? Scott McCurry likes to take credit for it. It's really not his, but f8 and be there. I'm Australian, so we say it a little bit differently. We say f8 is your mate. <laughs> you like that? You like that? Also, Australians are playing on it. Um, people think that, OK, what we need to do is go to a really tight aperture, 22, 32, and get the highest depth of field possible. Let me tell you why we don't want to do that. If you shoot on f22, um, you're going to actually get a much softer end photograph. And the reason for that is, and I want you to think of it like a funnel. Think of aperture like a funnel that we're pouring water into. When you've got the big hole, water is able to come in very, very, very quickly, but it's all going to catch in the funnel and come through, which is why we get that softer focus, right? On f4, we get that shallow depth of field. So if we turn the funnel upside down, so we've got the narrow end, up the top, and we're pouring water into that, what's going to happen with the water? It's going to spill over the sides. And as it spills into the lens, it's actually going to start seeping through those, those blades, those cracks in the blades of our aperture when our aperture is closed. And it starts doing what's called diffracting. It diffracts into our shot, and it actually makes it very, very, very soft. F8 gives us a really sharp, clear, crisp image. 8 to 11. You can go to 11. It just, 11 doesn't rhyme with mate. Uh, shutter speed. I'm a big fan of the slowest shutter speed possible. I think travel photography should really be about the slowest shutter speed possible. The slower the shutter speed, the more vibrant your photograph is going to get. The more data the camera is going to be able to capture, the more color is, is going to really just pop. Um, and the more light is coming in, obviously. Moving water is going to slow and mist. Um, running water, sorry, running water is yeah, going to slow and mist. Still water is going to become reflective. Think about that shot of the Capitol building with that puddle. You know, a 10 second exposure lets me really pull into that puddle a little bit. Remember again, anything moving faster than the shutter speed is going to vanish, uh, which means those tourists are going to disappear unless they're standing there having a chat. I really don't like those tourists. <laughs> uh, let's talk a bit about composition. Oh, I've got a waterfall to show you. Let me go back. So, Running water is going to slow and mist. It's going to come out. We call it in Australia the fairy floss effect. I guess you'd call it cotton candy. It's the same thing. Um, but it really just gives us that nice, soft, soft water thing. And you can do that in the middle of the day with that uh, ND variable filter, variable ND. 
Let's talk about composition. Composition. OK. For the next part, um, we're going to talk, start talking about the rule of, um, rule of thirds. OK. So let's think about those rule of thirds. Um, I'm just going to bring them all up on the screen quickly, just so, because I think I put the rule of thirds in grid. At, there we go. OK. So there's our rule of thirds. Um, if you, who here has heard David Bremer speak about rule of thirds? few people. I actually have told him I want to run a seminar here called Annoying Other Photographers, How to Successfully Break the Rule of Thirds. Um, I haven't seen it on the schedule yet. But let's talk about, ab about using the rule of thirds. We want to put our horizon line on one of these two horizontal third lines. Okay? Our focal point, the subject of our story, we want to put on one of these four intersecting points. Everything else in the image, I try to get working along the lines. And I do like to try and get foreground, midground, and background if I'm shooting sweeping up. And two thirds of positive space and one third of negative space. Left to right is also important. Who has seen Pirates of the Caribbean? Not as many people that have been to Machu Picchu. Wow. OK, Pirates of the Caribbean, if you watch that movie, uh, Jeffrey Rush, Australian actor, incidentally, who uh, plays Captain Barbosa. If you watch that movie, every time he's in a scene with Johnny Depp or Kira Knightley, from our point of view, he's standing on the left. That's because he knows, as a classically trained actor, that the human eye moves left to right. And he knew that if he was in a scene with Johnny Depp and Kira Knightley, and the human eye took him in before they took him in, he wasn't going to get any screen attention. <laughs> so very cleverly, he kept positioning himself on the other side of Johnny Depp and Kira Knightley. Um, and when we've got our composition pretty correct, we can then make our photograph. At that point, we might need to do something else. And I like to call that step MacGyvering. Does anyone here not know who MacGyver is? OK. With chicken wire and bubble gum and a little bit of duct tape, you can make anything happen. And it needs to be like that with our photograph. Let's step away from Machu Picchu a little bit. This is a place called Lindhurst Castle. It's about 40 minutes from here. It's one of, it's, yeah, you have a castle in your backyard, New Yorkers. Um, it is about 40 minutes from New York. It's really absolutely beautiful. but. What's tragically wrong with it is that the sky is just coming out. So talking about my kit before, I went, OK, I'm going to use that graduated ND filter and try and equalize my sky and my ground. And no, that didn't work. It came in looking really horrible. So I was like, OK, I'm going to come and shoot this again at night. So I came in and took a photo again about 10 hours later. It was 1 in the morning. And I started getting just really dark patches. I got this one floodlight coming inside this one, and you can see the floodlight in the garden. Actually, you can see it in that earlier shot. You can see it down there. So that was casting that light, and it was shining on one part of the castle, and then the rest of it was just going really dark. So then I went for a really long exposure. How long can I make this exposure to try and even out that light? And that looked really tragic as well. It was like, <laughs> no, it's blown out. It's, yeah. So then I had to MacGyver my image, and I took that floodlight. I went down, I set my camera on a timer, 30 second exposure. And while the camera was, uh, was, as soon as I heard it click, I started painting. Using their floodlight, I used their floodlight and I started painting the castle with their floodlight. <laughs> MacGyverism. I didn't need chicken wire, but I got a pretty good photograph. So we start getting just that evenness coming through um, and we start getting a better photograph as a result. So you might need to MacGyver your images. Now it might not be that extreme, but think about what else is around you. Think about Quite often, I, I'm using duct tape in my bag to prop up trees or branches out of my way so I can get a better shot. Okay, leave your environment how you found it, but you know, play with it a little bit. You know, play with it a touch. Uh, let's have a look. Removing distractions. Okay, so as I was talking about the surfer on the beach before, if it was a bicycle or a dinosaur, it wouldn't have been as cool. Surfer, it's not too bad. I like to use the example that if Leonardo da, um, da Vinci had painted the Mona Lisa and include, included construction equipment in the background. <laughs> I'm going to hell for that, by the way. Um, if he included construction equipment in the, included instruction, uh, construction equipment in the background, would it have been as effective painting? No. It's, what we want to do is try and remove our distractions. And generally, what I could have done there is moved a little bit to the, my left of Mona Lisa and hid the construction equipment behind her head. So just move around, moving around a little bit, moving in a little bit, moving up or down a little bit is going to remove 90% of your, your distractions. OK? Uh, let's have a look. Next. Ensure I love it. OK, so that was our initial test photo. 
I then took my next exposure, um, which was that. So ND filter to get rid of the tourists, stepped around a little bit to the side just to try and get that slightly different vantage point. You can still see six tourists that wouldn't move. There's one. Red shirt, stands out. Um, I still wasn't thrilled with it. I didn't love it, it was a good photo. So again, reevaluating my photographic goals. I'd had a day previously walking around. Um, I pretty much knew the outlay of Machu Picchu then, so I could figure out what's something I could do that no one else was doing. What if I don't need that big sweeping grand, whew, everything coming through? And so this was my final shot of Machu Picchu. Be different. So I took it from low. Everyone takes much a picture from high. I took it from low. Take it from something completely different is going to um, is going to make it memorable. It's going to make it work. Has anyone ever here been on a, a one of those like sightseeing bus tours? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Bus driver pulls up at a waterfall or a lookout. You've got 15 minutes, then back on the bus. <laughs> Everyone gets off the bus and they rush and they're elbowing their way to the lookout and they're all taking the same photo for 10 minutes and then they get back on the bus. I usually wait until they're finished and then I'll, I'll be watching what they're doing and I'll actually go and take something completely different just for the sake of being different. We all get back on the bus and they're all feeling pretty proud of themselves of taking you know, 19 identical photos. They're like, yes, I got the same photo, look! And they're really, really proud of themselves. It just freaks me out. Um, and then Bob usually comes up to me. Bob's usually the person that um, said at the beginning of the trip, oh, you're a photographer. You're going to get hundreds of great photos. Usually comes up and says, oh, Luke, what did you take? And I generally show them mine. I wish I could be impolite and not show them, but at that point, I know I'm going to. Um, and Bob turns around and says, hey, Jim, look at what Luke took. He's a photographer, you know, look, come look. And then my camera gets passed around the bus. About 15 minutes later, we pull up at another lookout and the bus driver says, OK, everyone, off you get. And everyone's just standing back. They're watching. Where's he, Where's he going? Where's he going? I also love getting the question. I'm using a DSLR too. Why are your photos so much different to mine? OK, take it off automatic. <laughs> it's just usually the first thing. Um, but look, if I can get away from the group, if I can get away from the tourists, if I can get away from what everyone else is doing, the chances are I'm going to get something different. I'm going to get something that's, that's pretty striking and something that, you know, whether or not I sell it is a different story, but it's nice for me. This is actually one of, I only have 10 photos on my living room wall that I've taken. I only have my photos on my wall because, you know, it's my wall, damn it. I don't have my own gallery like Peter Lick, so they're on my wall. Um, and I only have 10 photos on, and this is one of the ones on there. It is actually one of my favorite photos that I've taken. Uh, how are we going for time? Wow, I've actually been zipping through this. Cool. OK, that's good, because we're going to talk about new stuff. Um, if you want to be a travel photographer, you need to travel. <laughs> Just saying. Um, I have been to six continents. I have been to 110 legally recognized countries. Keyword they're legally recognized. If I'm including some of the stands, I'm probably sitting somewhere at 122, 23. I'd have to work it out. Um, here in the US, though, you've got a lot of opportunity that no one else in the world has. Okay, it takes you three days, of, you know, fairly non-stop and not stopping to take photos, driving, but three days you can cross your country. In that three days, you're going to encounter beaches, rainforests, jungles. Deserts, canyons, monuments, mountains, waterfalls, national parks, wildlife, like anything you could possibly want in the world, snow, ice, you know, anything you could possibly want in the world is here made in the US of A. Um, you know, you're only a six hour flight to Europe. I mean, there's six hours, I mean, for me to go anywhere in the world, it's 24 hours, like <laughs> a, apart from Thailand. But it's, it's, it's a big trip. Um, but you've got the world from here on the East Coast, you've got the world pretty much at your fingertips. You can go anywhere and really sort of spending that time traveling. I can't get over how cheap it is to travel from here as well. I was looking at, is it Icelandic Air to Reykjavik? It's like 650 return. It's three and a half thousand dollars from Australia. I'm sitting here going, while we're here, baby, we're going to Reykjavik. Because <laughs> we can. Um, and it's one of the countries that I haven't been to. Um, but America, look, I mean, you guys have so much 
uh, so much opportunity here to get really good travel photos. Um, that's actually what I'm going to be spending 2014 doing. This is a, actually a big announcement. It's, this is actually the first time we're actually announcing it. Uh, it's actually going live on our website next week. So you are hearing it here first. Uh, in 2014, we're doing the world tour. If you can call it a world series, I can call it a world tour. <laughs> we're only going into the US. Um, who here watches Survivor, anyone? It's like 48 states, 10 months, one photographer. That's pretty much the plan. I've always wanted to be Jeff Prost. The, uh, what we're actually doing for uh, 10 months from February through to the end of November, early December in 2014, we are hitting 46 states with advanced workshops. So for every weekend, we'll be running workshops in all the major cities around the United States. Um, and during the week, that Monday to Friday, we're going to be ad offering advanced, like very, very advanced day in the life of a travel photographer, advanced uh, seminars and workshops at all the locations. Hey, you want to do, be a travel photographer at Mount Rushmore? We're doing that for a day. So all these different places around America are actually going to be covered on the Remember Forever <coughs> world tour. <coughs> uh, the project's called Photographing America. It is going live at the end of the week and it starts in February. Um, those advanced workshops, What's really cool about those, there are, you can either pay for them or you can do one of our basic workshops and get it for free if you come out. So it's actually going to be a really good way of seeing America if anyone wants to do it. We're going to be driving around, this is the fun part, in an RV. <laughs> so for, for 10 months, I'm going to be living in an RV and driving around the country. Uh, the route's all mapped out. It's something that's been worked on for about six months um, in negotiations. Uh, and we're pretty excited that um, it's all coming to fruition. So we're about to announce it like I said, next week, but we decided we'd give you a bit of a sneak preview just purely because I'm talking about travel photography. Uh, let's talk a bit more about travel photography. Not traveling is not an excuse. As I said right at the beginning, that travel photography can be one of the easier, easier uh, forms of, of photography purely because there's so much opportunity. There are so many to topics. I mean, you could walk outside B&H now, you could cross the road and there's something to photograph. I mean, street photography is taking on a life of its own. Travel photography is everywhere. I mean, um, the photos I've taken since being in New York, just, you know, and I can't get those anywhere else in the world, but sure enough, in my own city of Brisbane, there are photos I can get that I can't get here as well. Um, it is really hard though. Uh, it's very easy for me as a photo travel photographer to ignore where I live. I might sit there go, I can do it anytime. I can come back and do this anytime. So I don't journal it. I don't plan it out or research it or prep it as much as I might six months in South America or 10 months around the US. It doesn't have that same urgency to it. Um, so what I try and do, um, and if you're looking at sort of setting yourself up as a bit of a travel photographer in your own hometown, uh, this isn't on the thing, so pen and paper. Um, set yourself a theme. What I recommend you do if you really want to improve your travel photography around here on the streets of New York is set yourself a theme. Now your theme can be anything. It can be a shape. I'm going to photograph circles, and you're looking for circles in your travel photography. It can be, I'm going to photograph a color, you're looking for blue. It can be, I'm looking for reflections. But remember what I said before, that if I'm not prepared, if I'm not researched, if I don't have those photographic goals, I'm wandering around aimlessly going, what should I photograph? So what we want to do is give ourselves a theme just to guide us on the start of, of wandering around. And it's something I do need to spend a bit more time doing here in New York as well. Um, let's look at the other side of the coin. We started today talking about Africa. You know, it's, it's the same thing for them though. Like, you've got some of the best photos I've seen in Africa weren't taken by photographers. In fact, I don't think they knew how to work a camera. But they've got so much opportunity. The guides and the trackers that ride around in the trucks and keep you safe. They've got so much opportunity and they know the animals' mannerisms and characteristics and habitats and everything else around. And they're just waiting for that opportunity. Um, who's heard the expression, by the time you see a photograph, it's too late to take it? <laughs> yeah, always be ready to take your photograph. Um, getting up early. Okay, this is for those of you that were here last time, this is brand new content. Get up early. Um, I have this, this belief that anyone who thinks sunset's better than sunrise just doesn't want to get out of bed. Um, I, have the, I actually tell all my photographers, all, all the photographers that work for me, and there's currently about 20 of them around the world, um, real f travel photographers get up at 3 a.m. Professional travel photographers do it on a Monday. <laughs> um, 
if you're not out chasing the sunrise, you're not going to miss it. Now, the difference between sunrise and sunset is that, remember we were talking before about um, how light travels slowly, so things moving faster than the shutter speed will vanish from the shot. Because light travels slowly, if we're shooting of a morning, light is coming into a default dark state. So all those colors are just those colors. It's not overbearing sunlight that's coming in. At sunset, that sunlight is the default. So it's taking away a lot of the vibrancy of color. The same photograph at 4 in the morning can be taken on a 2 minute exposure and maybe a 15 second exposure at sunset. Remember what I said before about the slower the shutter speed, the more vibrancy, the more data, the more information, the more light, the more magic that comes in your photo. I'm a big believer in magic. I ended up giving up explaining someone, something to someone on Saturday and just said, it's magic, just, just go with it. And you know, she was happy. But all of that stuff comes at 4 in the morning. Uh, everything's also really brand new, I guess is the best way to put it. So, you know, the grass isn't trodden on. It's all sort of, you know, dewy and bouncy and springy from the night of precipitation. It's, it's, it's all fresh and you do get that coming through. Um, th those important, really important, we can see them, the purples and the reds, um, they're a lot more prominent uh, at sunrise, sorry, at sunset. They're more likely to be sort of an off blue and a yellowy orange. You know, you're really not going to get that vibrancy of color. Um, when the sun is first breaching that horizon, about 4 a.m., 5 a.m. here at the moment in winter, um, like I said, two, three minute shutter speeds are possible without filters. And, you know, getting it pure from the camera, that's not too bad. I like mornings. Who here has never gotten up to photograph a sunrise? <laughs> One, two. Who here is just not admitting it because I <laughs> called you guys? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, guys, find locals. Um, people in your photograph can make a huge difference in your photograph. Okay, it can really, really, really change it up. Um, every city in the world has a culture, has a vibrancy, has a vibe, has a feeling, and we can get that from people in our photograph. Not tourists. We don't want tourists. We want, uh, we want the locals. We want the you know old man playing chess in Washington Square Park, or we want. Uh, think about the people you sort of see on a day-to-day -day basis, the ones that live around here. They might be shopping at a market, buying a paper, walking a dog in New York, um, but they're part of our landscape, like the surfer in my first photo. I took this photo in Africa. Uh, this was taken in, I want to say it was in South Africa near Kruger. Um, and I try and capture that emotion coming through. Like really if I'm photographing a local, I really want it not to be part of the scenery but part of the story. Can you see up here? She's carrying the little koala. When I travel, I carry around maybe 200 tiny little koalas in my camera bag. And every kid that comes up begging, because I don't know where the money's going, I give them a koala instead. And that way, it's something for them rather than something that their parents are going to take and spend. Um, but I really am trying to find, find those stories and really make it part of the landscape. Don't stop learning. OK, I read everything I can on photography. I look at um, 500 photographs a week, I would say. Um, I actually learn from my students. If I have some of my students sending me photos to critique, I'm also learning what not to do. No, I'm <laughs> sorry, I couldn't resist. Um, I, yeah. I'm learning, uh, but I'm learning different things. Like I'm seeing perhaps uh, an angle or a perspective that I might never have considered. I might have thought, no, that's not going to work. And they've pulled it off, and I'm like, ooh. That's interesting, you know, I like it. Um, but I, I try and learn every day. Um, I read every book, I look at photos every day. But you know what, I take photos every day. Um, if there is a day that I don't take photos, my wife knows about it over dinner. I am grumpy, I am miserable. <laughs> they say it takes 500 practice hours to become proficient at something. Not, not a master, but proficient. I think it's something like uh, 20,000 hours makes you a master. 10,000? Yeah, but it's something ridiculous that I don't have, you know. Um, I'd rather spend 10, no, anyway. Um, but 500 hours makes you proficient. So if you were to pick up a guitar today and you were to practice it, you know, 15 minutes a day, four days a week, what's that, it's an hour a week, for 10 years, you're going to be proficient. <laughs> pick it up for five hours a day, do that, you know, five times a week, and do that for three months, you're going to be proficient. Are you? <laughs> awesome. I like exceptions. Okay. But 
take photos every day. Um, if I, yeah, wander around, explore your neighborhood, explore everything and you know, try new things. Look at other people's photos and sort of say, okay, what are they doing that I'm not? Um, ooh, what ideas can you get? What inspiration can you get from other people's work? Go and look at work. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, BNH has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.